I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. I can just see that happening. He's preached the gospel, sorry. He's preached the gospel, stand goes flying. He's preached the gospel, chained to a wall, chained to a Roman soldier, who knows what, he's in chains, and he's just led this guy to the Lord with his manacles on. Fantastic. You're not stopping him, are you? You're not stopping us. You're not stopping Paul much. No chance. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, now he's become useful. Both to you and to me, but I want him. I'm sending him with my very heart back to you. Paul is not unscarred by his sufferings for the gospel. He just keeps on with it. I'd have liked to keep him with me. I would have liked to keep him with me. I'm sending him back because it's the right thing to do. So that he could take I'd like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. He's going to need hands because he's chained to something. How'd you do your shopping? How'd you get the groceries in? How'd you clean your teeth? That's a very difficult question to answer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. How did he write this? How did he write this? Well, he's going to be writing it because he sounds at the end, doesn't he? Chains might be on his feet. The chains might be on his feet. Or he might have used his feet to write. <laughs> now we're getting fanciful, <laughs> and I think we should move it forwards. Okay. So, there's the contents of Paul's appeal, I want him. Here's the power of it, verses 14 to 16. The basis of Paul's appeal, verse 8. The power of Paul's appeal, verse 9. The content of Paul's appeal, verses 10 to 13. The power of Paul's appeal, verses 14 to 16. I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the very reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, even dearer to you. Both as a fellow man, as a brother in the Lord. Paul keeps saying that. He's a brother. He's a brother. He's a brother. He's my slave! He's your brother. He's your brother. Do you notice that he keeps doing that? He keeps on playing that particular note, doesn't he? He's your brother. Okay, so fugitive slaves often fled to Rome. The anonymity of the big city. They wouldn't get caught easily there and turned back. So God took Onesimus to Rome. Very long way, 600 miles or something, can't remember the distance. Very long way to meet Paul, to meet Jesus, and to get converted. <laughs> and, uh, who are you despairing of at the moment as I like to say? There's a word play on the name of Onesimus. Onesimus means useful. It means useful. So Onesimus was very useful to Paul after the slave's conversion. But he'd been useless to Philemon before because he'd done a runner. He'd been off on his toes. So Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, asking Philemon to do what is right and proper in the changed circumstances with somebody who could have been useful to Philemon. But also the means of it. Well, I'm an old man. And I'm a prisoner of the gospel. And I'm Paul. Onesimus, he says, he's my very heart. I'm sending him back. But I want to keep him. Why? So that the obligation Philemon is under to help God's servant. Ooh. Ooh, can we talk about that? Paul did. Especially to help God's servant like Paul at the moment, who's suffering because he taught you the Bible. So that your obligation to me, says Paul, might at least be met in your place by your servant. He could take your place in helping me while I am in chains. How is Philemon ever going to say no? <laughs> because, bear in mind, this is a public letter sent to the church that meets in his home. How can Paul do that? He can do it because he knows the character of Philemon, the way that his character has been utterly changed radically by the power of the gospel. Otherwise, Paul could never be doing this, could he? What a testimony. What confidence. What an impact. On a church of all places, we all know what they're like. Fantastic, isn't it? What a picture. There's the power of Paul's appeal. God's been at work there and changed stuff. There's the power of it. How does he spell it out? Well, he says, uh, Providence, the hand of God is visible in this. You know, who knows, but God brought it for me so that you could have him back. He was always a slave, but as a, as a good brother. We can 
is in the hand of God in this, verse 15. And it's got the scent of grace about it. Verse 16. There's the hand of God in it. You know, non-Christians ask us to go and do Shantawa Lee's work. Look at that. There's a non-Christian offering us a cafe as a place to go and and go in there. It's, it's unusual. So that we can go teach the Bible to the children of the town and have a service on a Sunday morning or do something in the week. Is there any wonder? There's nothing wrong with that, eh? This trailer, <laughs> bonkers. Is there any God in that? A few things along the way. Please pray for that, Gabriel. Paul said, oh, this is, these two things are not linked. I shouldn't have said that. I know they say, Paul says, I appeal to you. No, no, no. <laughs> I appeal to you, says Paul. Right? The hand of providence is in this. And also there's the scent of grace about it. Grace in your heart will always lead to self-sacrifice. The self comes down. The grace of God goes up. He comes up. He comes down. It comes to you from and calls you to follow the Saviour. Grace calls you to follow the Saviour. And the Saviour poured out his life unto death, even death on a cross. Apologies for the King James. The scent of grace never lies far from glad personal sacrifice. Glad. <laughs> That's the difficult bit. Feel a little calm, but glad bits are in there. I'm appealing to you, says Paul, not because I'm commanding you, not because you've got to, but on the basis of grace. Caleb and I were chatting yesterday, it was brilliant, uh, a couple of days, with Caleb in front of a brand new Land Rover bringing this trailer back for our food bank thing. Um, <clears throat> Caleb and I were chatting, and I, I occasionally quote C.T. Studd, which you could get sick of me quoting C.T. Studd, but, you know, there's things about it, but honestly, sometimes, what a motivational character. The measure of the Christian man is just how much suffering he's ready to take. Might take a Land Rover down the motor. <laughs> I didn't ask you to expound it, Callum. It gets a little bit bad. <laughs> but yeah, do you see what I mean? Joyful sacrifice on the same of grace. And then far from one another. Because we follow a crucified Saviour. Because of His grace. And by His grace. The same of grace. And then the key issue, verse 14 then. You see, grace working out is what it's all about. Grace working out. Not forced, verse 14. Graciousness born out of grace. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains with the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. So any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. If you've got a bit of a cross to bear, I guess you have. Go back to Jesus. Get a bit of a cross again to bear. Get a bit of a cross. But he could have walked away from it. Bearing your cross means picking up what you could have walked away from. But think about it. think about the passion and things that lead up to the crucifixion. You had every opportunity to walk away. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Bearing your cross is the stuff you pick up and carry forwards voluntary because of the grace of God and because of the way He's impacted your life and changed you. It's not because I've got I don't think it's something none of us in this room has got. It's a bit difficult. <laughs> not because you've got X, Y, Z going on, because we've got our own ailments and our whatever's going on. We've got our, you know, we're all rolling in money, let's face it. Um, so, you know, not those things. It's the things we pick up and deal with because of the grace of God and because of its impact on our life. That, that's carrying you across and following Jesus, isn't it? It's what we take up. I want you to do this voluntarily, he says to Philemon. See the point? No value in it if you've got to. It doesn't say anything about the grace of God if you've got to. Philemon has lost his slave. Unless he's paid good money for him. <laughs> How about volunteering him? In the service of the kingdom of God. Sacrifice him. Because of the grace you've received. To the service of God in the gospel. Personal sacrifice in the situation that was being born with to serve and glorify Jesus. That's what he was asking for. 
Have I gone for long enough? Yes. Right. We'll quickly to a conclusion. At one level, Pete, Paul is being really cheeky in this letter. He's being really cheeky. Can I persuade you, please? Can we? He's asking for what he's humanly got no right to ask for. And he doesn't seem embarrassed to be asking a person who's taught the Bible to do this, if he's willing to do his preacher his favour. But Paul knows that he has the authority from God to ask. He has the authority from God to command. He says, he says, but he's not doing that. And he doesn't even reason on the basis of apostolic authority. He reasons on the basis that I've taught you the gospel, man. I've brought you God's grace. I've taught you the gospel. I've ministered God's word to you. Not I am an apostle and you will do this. God, look, I've taught you the stuff that through which God has saved your life. It's the authority of one who taught Philemon the gospel, brought God's word to him, authority to ask Philemon to do this big counter-cultural thing, even socially revolutionary thing, because this is Rome and there's a lot of slavery and it's a hot potato politically. He lays that aside, that authoritarian approach does Paul, because he's conditioned by grace. And because Philemon is conditioned by grace and he knows it, and he says, let's give the world all around you in Colossae one big demo of what grace looks like so they'll know the reality of our God. We are Christian community. Shalom. God is glorified by this early church emphasis, priority of saturation with grace, being the driver of sacrificial Christian conduct, radical, costly, self-sacrificial Christian conduct, born of the love that proves this gospel is real. That's Any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. And that is something the world does not understand. That is something that makes the world around us very curious. And that is something that speaks very eloquently of both grace and of the love that it engenders in sinful human beings who turn from sin and trust. best possible evidence of the reality of our God. Which is why this morning I retweeted a quote from Leslie Newbegin, which a friend in France has put up. And the quote goes like this. The best apologetic of the gospel is a congregation that believes it. I'd go a bit further on that. <laughs> that. That was early days, that was Newbegin. The best apologetic of the gospel is a Christian community, living with grace written right through it, like the letters through the rock, conditioning our responses, our attitudes, and the way we live, by his grace.